Welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we talk with people from all walks of the publishing industry. I'm Christy Stratus, historical fantasy and historical suspense author, and my awesome co-hosts are epic fantasy author Richard H. Stevens and sci-fi author David M. Kelly. Lurking for Legends Hi. is an interactive broadcast, and we encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guests or comment on anything you might hear in the show. So we are going to just talk a little bit about what is going on with us first, and then we will introduce you to a guest I bet a lot of you will know. So um, let's start with David tonight. David, what's going on with you this week? Okay, uh, so I've been doing some more work on uh, Hyperia Jones book two. Uh, this week I've taken a little bit of a break from actually writing it, and I've actually been working on my Lacundan. Uh, I'm inventing a new language for okay. Hyperia. Uh, <laughs> I was going to pretend I knew what that was. I was yeah. just gonna... <laughs> complete with tentacles. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So uh, I've been working on that for a few days, and uh, it's proving to be quite challenging. But uh, hopefully, it should be fun in the end. Yeah. It's it's all silly fun. Are you like actually coming up with rules to the language? Yes, I, uh, oh. I actually use a, um, there's a, an application online um, called, oh, what is it called? I could tell you in a, in a second. It's called um, vulgalang.com, which sounds as though it's, uh, it sounds more vulgar than it is. It's yeah. just, just a vulgar language as in creating a language. Um, and uh, that will generate languages for you, but you can then customize the language and, and kind of like add in your own extras and your own rules and all this kind of mm. stuff. And it gets really, really detailed. It's crazy how detailed this gets. Um, and so I'm kind of like struggling to try and understand all of these different elements to this sort of thing. Um, I've used it before, but never to quite this l level of detail. So it's uh, it's proven quite challenging, but uh, quite fun too. Wow, that is really cool. Okay, good luck with that. I'm sure if anybody can uh, make that work, I'm sure it's you. <laughs> That's really cool. Thank How about you, Richard? <laughs> yeah, no, I've uh, still been taking some time off. I'm uh, trying to tie up a lot of loose ends uh, around the other bits of publishing that uh, we have to look after after independent as independent authors there's mm -hmm. always something in the background that we need to redo every time we write a new book all the back matter changes and just so many different things that we got to look after so i've been uh, trying to take time before i dive back into uh, this high cliff guardian series so that's what i've been doing but but today i am really looking forward to our guest and i'll let you introduce him in a minute christy but i just want everyone to know before he comes on that uh uh, there are a lot of helpful people out there. Dave's been very helpful. You've been very helpful, Christy. But I don't think I've ever come across anyone as humble and helpful as uh, our guest who's coming on today, Mark Leslie. He is such a down-to-earth person, and you can ask him any question you want, and he'll just gladly answer with a smile on his face. You know, he's not put out whatsoever. You can ask whatever you want, and uh, you, if you give him an IPA beer, he's he's your friend for life. So I'm looking forward to talking <laughs> to Mark today. So. I mean, there's really nothing going on with me right now, Christy. So what's up with you? Uh, well, for me, um, as always, I have a new episode of Corrupted Magic up this week. It's episode 13, and it's called The Unthinkable. And this one is a big one. This is the moment we've been waiting for for a little while now. So I'm super excited about it. I hope everyone enjoys it. It's very intense. So um, really excited about that. I did take a little bit of a break writing um, the remaining, you know, more episodes of Corrupted Magic just because um, I had written myself into a place I just didn't like at all what I had written. So I did um, take that break and look back at what I was doing and um, I will be catching back up again soon. But, you know, I'm like a few episodes ahead, so there won't be any delay on your part. And another thing I'm doing this month is that I have... If you go to my website, which I'm going to post here, um, if you go to my website this month and you buy a paperback book, which is either Anatomy of a Darkened Heart or Brotherhood of Secrets, uh, you will get a free Halloween gift. So it can be anywhere between Ooh. today and, yeah, and the end of October. And you can actually pick on my website what you want. 
um, and I'll send that to you. So, you know, just something fun, a little treat for you this month, especially since uh, my books really go well with this month. They're, uh, you know, psychological suspense, historical suspense. Um, the first one's been called psychological horror. So, you know, kind of the right read <laughs> for this month. So just check out my website and you can you can get that for free. So, okay, without further ado, Richard did an amazing Just introduction. Before you bring Mark on, I understand his favorite beers are um, Coors and Budweiser. So, oh, yeah, I've definitely heard that too. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's everyone should buy him that, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are introducing uh, Mark Leslie, and Mark is, uh, I'm sure so many of you know, super talented, of course, um, Canadian author of nonfiction, urban fantasy, thriller, and beyond. I can't even list it all. So welcome, Mark. We're so happy to have you. Hey, welcome, great. Uh, hey, great Mark. to be here. I'm so excited I get to hang out with you guys. Yeah, yeah. We're really excited about it, too. So I don't think you really need that much of an introduction, but just in case somebody happens to tune in who doesn't know you too well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm an author and a book nerd. Uh, like, so sum, sum me up in three words, but I've been in the book industry since nine, 1992. That was the year I sold my very first short story and made five whole dollars uh, for that <laughs> short story. Um, I've got about 30 different books out. Uh, I've got books for writers uh, written under this long, complicated name, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. And uh, that's only because I've worked in the book industry as Mark Lefebvre, and I was known in that part of the industry. But I chose to write under my middle name, Mark Leslie, because most people could spell and pronounce it. And most of my stuff is speculative fiction in nature. So urban fantasy, horror, true ghost stories, paranormal, stuff like that, and some thrillers. Uh, um, and I've just been around the block a few times. I've also worked in the industry for a long time. I've been a bookseller. Uh, 92 is when I started in the book industry. And I, I worked for Kobo for six years. I helped create their self-publishing platform, Kobo Writing Life. Cool. And then I tried to go full-time. I was making enough money to go full-time, but but uh, I couldn't do it because when I had too much time to write, I watched cat videos online instead of doing my work. <laughs> so I didn't make it a full year when I was hanging out with the folks from draft to digital at a, at a writer's conference in Florida and uh, took on a part-time role with them 20 hours a week. And that was perfect for me because... Uh, Kobo, I was working 60 plus hours a week and I wasn't able to get writing done uh, as much as I wanted to. I still made it happen, but uh, yeah, those cat videos. <laughs> but one of, the, one of the things that was really cool was um, the 20 hours a week was perfect for me because it took up enough of my calendar that I took the rest of my week seriously. And I've actually been more productive since 2018 to now than I had probably in the previous 20 odd years of writing. Wow, so we could learn some uh, time management from you just from your introduction. That's, that's fantastic. I love it. <laughs> the trick is not too much free time. <laughs> I, You know what? It's so funny that you should say that because just that last week I had more free time and I, I didn't write much at all. Yeah. No, it was the same kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, JD. No, all about being stretched thin. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Exactly. So you say you, so, you started the book business in 1992. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's like before the rest of us were born. Uh, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. No, I mean, I graduated from university that year with a degree in English language and literature, so what could I do? I was working part-time as a security guard, part-time uh, at a theater doing backstage stuff, and then I also got a part-time job at a bookstore, um, and that's when it happened to me. It was it was part-time seasonal help at a Kohl's in Ottawa. Uh, I was part-time seasonal help. It was Kohl's number 23, a store on Spark Street. Beautiful, giant store. And I just got bit by the book bu bug. And I thought, hey, I mean, I don't get paid as a writer anyway. I may as well not get paid well as a bookseller. And and I just, <laughs> I just, I loved working in the book industry, learning so much about books, um, the good, the bad, the ugly, and then just continuing to work in the industry. And I worked in bookstores up till 1999. I moved to Chapters Online. And then I moved back to a bookstore, uh, an academic bookstore, McMaster University, um, yeah, a few years later uh, when my son was born and, and I was tired of commuting into Toronto. I wanted to be close to home. So McMaster University was a 10 minute drive. And uh, I, I'd like to say I've worked in every kind of bookstore, um, mall, chain, independent, academic, big box, um, e online, ebook. The only two I haven't worked for are a used bookstore 
or uh, a Christian bookstore. So if anyone's hiring uh, for either one of those a part-time <laughs> position, I'd love to get, you know, just say I could work at every single kind of bookstore. I, I'll go for it. That's awesome. <laughs> so I know that uh, just recently you just finished publishing uh, Canadian Mounted, which is quite a very interesting book. It's uh, I love the cover and I love the premise of it. And if you, uh, and people have watched the movie many, many times. Hopefully, they'll see the. If you show the cover again, you you had it up in front of your face when we first came on there. If you don't mind showing us the cover again, there if uh, if you can picture, uh, who was it? John Candy actually reading that, or was that uh, John Candy? Yeah, so John Candy. So you picture yeah. Mark as John Candy, and <laughs> I, I know Mark, and uh, he's a joker like John Candy sometimes too. So. That, that book actually looks very good in front of you. I know you, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the story behind that book? So um, in the movie Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, which is celebrating its 35th anniversary come November 25th, 2022. It, was, it came out in November 25th, which is American Thanksgiving, 1987. It's a classic John Hughes movie starring John Candy and Steve Martin. Steve Martin plays an uptight executive for people who haven't seen it. Um, and if you haven't, shame on you, really, treat yourself. Go watch the movie. Steve Martin's an uptight executive trying to get home for Thanksgiving. He's you know commuting into New York to, to do stuff with an ad agency, and he just wants to get home for, for a nice family dinner uh, with his family. He bumps into John Candy, who's a blabbermouth, loudmouth, traveling salesman with a heart of gold. And it's this odd couple of the two of them stuck together as they're playing gets rerouted from New York to Chicago, nice quick commute, he ends up going to Wichita because of a snowstorm, uh, stuff gets canceled, they end up taking trains, buses, taxis, rental cars, all kinds of planes, trains, and automobiles, and, and it's a really amazing movie, and it was John Hughes's first um, venture into adult film, actually, and, and so what this is, is it, there's a scene when uh, Del Griffith, uh, played by John Candy, um, uh, meets Steve Martin's character, Neil Page, for the very first time at LaGuardia Airport in New York. And uh, John Candy's already accidentally taken Steve Martin's cab, and Steve Martin's already tripped over, over this trunk that John Candy has. So they've already kind of encountered each other, but they haven't met officially. So John Candy's sitting there reading this book, and it was a sort of an inside joke because John Candy is a Canadian actor. So the Canadian Mounted in the script was described as... You know, Del Griffith is reading a pornographic novel, and so obviously this this uh, book was a book. Uh, I thought it was a prop book initially, um, and then I saw in the movie Deadpool, Ryan Reynolds had a mock-up of this book made, and Wade uh, Wilson is reading it, and there's a scene where he's holding it, saying, "I'll be in the bathroom," jokingly, you know, as as the lowbrow humor of Deadpool, and and Ryan Reynolds, Canadian actor, was a huge fan of John Hughes. And he admitted, um, it was actually in a, in a May uh, 2022 interview with David Letterman, he said, I had the prop book made to, to match the one John Candy was holding. Now, I thought they were prop books, and I wanted to release this. So I had this book up for pre-order, and then I learned, somebody contacted me on my web form, somebody who had a John Hughes podcast and was very knowledgeable and research, said, no, 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 it was a real book published by Beeline, which did a lot of adult erotic novels or as what we called them in the book industry back in those days we called them one-handers <clears throat> just the nickname that you had for these um and it was uh, the 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 publisher went out of business this may have been its last book published so and it was never filed for copyright so i managed to get a hold of a scan of the original model mocked up the cover to to kind of mock up the, uh, the exactly what it looked like the only difference obviously the text and everything is different except for the title the only difference is that book didn't have a barcode, and um, I changed it from Northern Nymph to Northern Tribute, and I talked about how it was inspired. So what this is is a trivia guide to planes, trains, and automobiles, and it's just basically trivia and then bloopers and mistakes in the film. I also do a deep analysis of two of the scripts I got my hands on. John Hughes had 25 versions of scripts because he just kept rewriting, rewriting, and he was even rewriting because even the final shooting script does not match what's in the film because wow. he would let the actors ad lib. And so it was kind of like the, the, you know, the scene, those aren't pillows, uh, the, the classic scene. 
I mean, it's not written that way exactly. It's it's a completely different way. They don't even say those aren't pillows. He just says, where's your other hand? And then their eyes go wide and stuff like that. And then they jump out of bed. <laughs> and then somewhere in the ad living, it was between two pillows and, and that sort of came out of it. So um, I'm a huge fan of the, of, the, of the movie. I've seen it probably 50 times. And I wanted to do this book for years and years and years. And, and so finally it, it came out and I can't, I have to stop working on it. <laughs> that was kind of how it came. It's like, oh, oh no, publication date's coming up. <laughs> Get this out the door. That's an amazing story. Yeah, it really that. is. Did it take you, so it took, did it take a while to write, like with all that research and your passion and everything? Yeah, so I was originally thinking, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I released a book called The Canadian Mounted? And, and I've edited anthologies. And my first idea was, I'll do an anthology I'll ask uh, writers to write a short story, submit to me, but call the story The Canadian Mounted, but it cannot be erotica. It could be any other genre, but it couldn't be erotica. And I was going to collect the stories together and go, we're going to have a book called The Canadian Mounted, and it's all these different stories. And then in the last chapter, I was going to do trivia. So about two years ago, I started kind of working on this. And as I was writing the trivia, it wasn't just a chapter. It was like, well, that chapter is going to be really long, and then I'm going to have to. So I was, I was, I was re out like going, well, I was originally going to take twelve stories, and now I can only take ten stories, and now I can. Oh, and I realized there's no point doing that because editing an anthology is a lot of work, uh, all the moving parts and, and stuff like that. And then I realized I had enough material to do a full anthology. And then even when I when I was contacted by. Um, by the person who uh, wants to remain anonymous, but really, really researched this well, shared a whole bunch of details with me, including that it was a real book. And that sort of changed everything for me going, oh my God, it could be a real book again. It could be a real boy. Um, so it was, it was, it was really, uh, it's just been a, a passion project for me. And then when I looked at it, I think it was last year, because I was working on it and working on it. And then last year, sometime in November, I went, how many years has it been since the movie came out? And I went, oh my God, 2022 is the 35th anniversary. Okay, there's my there's my cue. And I really started to go to town on it last November. Uh, I had notes and notes and pages and a PDF of, uh, of one of the manuscripts. I got a hold of a different P a PDF of a different manuscript. Um, but yeah, it's just been so much fun. I actually sat down to watch it again after the book came out with my son uh, on Canadian Thanksgiving. And actually just enjoyed the movie. And I did my very, very best. Because we've watched the movie probably a dozen times together. Um, I did my very, very best not to speak up in every scene and go, did you know that Kevin Bacon was in New York shooting? She's having a baby. And did you know that like all this trivia is like, dad, shut up. I just want to enjoy the movie. You have to have like two viewings of it. One where you enjoyed the movie and one where you say, okay, now listen, listen, listen. This, this, this is Mark's commentary version. Yeah. <laughs> That's perfect. You could almost do a live theater of that. <clears throat> uh, that would uh, be kind of fun. You know, like the, uh, what was the, uh, um, the old, the science fiction classics where they had people sitting in the theater and they're just yelling <laughs> yeah. stuff out. Yeah. <laughs> like Rocky Horror Picture Show kind of. <laughs> That'd be perfect. <clears throat> yeah. So, so that was. One uh, of your, yeah. mm -hmm. That's just one of your releases. Of course, you're publishing all the time. And we have another release mm -hmm. to talk about and that's, Lover's Moon. So tell us a little bit about that one too. Yeah, and and, and I brought props too, right? So Lover's Moon. Uh, I have a, an urban fantasy series. A Canadian Werewolf in New York was the first book in the series. Uh, also has other books in the series are Fear and Longing in Los Angeles and uh, Fright Night's Big City. Because um, I wanted to do a humorous look at what it might be like to be a werewolf living in a big city. How would you deal with the side effects and stuff like that? So he's sort of a bit of a superhero. He has superpowers as a human, and he's sort of a good guy. He just turns into a wolf, not an actual werewolf. He turns into a wolf, so a full, full-sized uh, wolf. And there was a backstory related to two of my main characters that I set up in the very first book. And I had readers write in and say, Michael and Gail used to be a couple. Now they're really good friends. Michael's still in love with her, but they broke up, and she dumped him. Uh, what's the story? How did they meet? How did they fall in love? And so I thought, oh, I'll write a, I'll write a short story to, you know, for my readers as a special treat for them. And I went and bought the book Romancing the Beat by Gwen Hades. I, I really, really highly recommend that book. Phenomenal book. I sort of figured out what to do. 
I went and I filled out the form and the chart and, and like the, the outline and stuff like that. And I started to write it and I wrote the first chapter from Michael's point of view. And then I went to Gail's point of view and I started to write her point of view. And I went, oh my God, I can't write her properly because I worshiped her just like Michael did um, because it's first person, um, um, past tense, per first person from Michael's perspective, all the stories are told from that. So suddenly trying to get into Gail's head, I couldn't do it. I, I had this block. So uh, Julie Strauss is a good friend of mine, and she's a brilliant um, women's fiction, uh, humorous romance author. Love her stuff. Every single book she's ever written is amazing. We've worked together before. She's helped edit some of my work. She was familiar with the Canadian Werewolf series. And so I said, Julie, what about if you did Gail? So um, Julie stepped up, and it ended up becoming a full-length book. We had Lover's Moon with Mark Leslie and Julie Strauss. And within the series, it's book five. The, the prologue and the epilogue are set in modern time, modern day, where it actually advances the story. And for people who are following the storyline, it's interesting, but very, very short. There's a flashback when they talk about how they first met. And that's the whole story. So within that, it's actually a complete romance with all the tropes. <laughs> you know, the, the, the tri-fail and all the stuff that happens in the relationship and the meet-cute. And we call the meet-cute the M-E-A-T-cute because, mm -hmm. you know, he's a wolf. Um, I think the log line is, um, which, which, I, which Julie came up with, with, which is brilliant. He's an alpha wolf and a beta boyfriend. She's dated every monster in New York City. It's time for their meet cute. And, and that's because she's always had really bad choice in men. Uh, but now she's met this humble, you know, beta Canadian man. <laughs> so um, it's been a lot of fun to do that, uh, to do that book with Julie. And we had so much fun that we're co-writing the next book uh, in the awesome. series, which is going back to urban fantasy and adventure. But I, it needs to be told from Michael's point of view and Gail's point of view, and they need to be separate. So I can't write a first-person story about what happens to someone else. Let's continue Gail's first-person story in this modern uh, tale. So that that's going to be um, that's going to be a fun one. So how do you guys go about writing that then? Do you write a chapter and then she writes her chapter and then you read that and then you write your chapter? Or you yeah, that's how we did it. So yeah, March of, of 2022. 20, uh, uh, so we, we started talking about this probably towards the end of the previous year. And then we, we kind of outlined it. I kind of showed her what I had for my rough outline. And then she went back in and fixed it and made it way better <laughs> because she's got way more experience. And also she outlines and I never outline. So I just kind of go, I think I know where it's going. Let's just see what happens, right? To see what the characters do. Yeah, no, um, which, yeah. I'm a discovery writer. Um, <laughs> but what we did is we outlined what was going to happen. And it was alternating chapters. You know, Michael, Gail, Michael, or Gail, Michael, Gail, Michael, Gail, Michael, et cetera. And so Julie sent me uh, a, a, a month and basically said, okay, day one, I write the chapter. I send it to you. You read it. You send the chapter next chapter to me the next day, and we went just went back and forth like that. I think we took, we had like a day off here and a day off there, space throughout mm -hmm. the month, and uh, and we turned it in. It was about um, sixty five thousand words um, mm -hmm. by the time we were finished. Maybe a little bit more, and, we, and then then I went to an editor and stuff like that. But we spent the entire month of May, uh, March, doing it. And what I loved about it was Julie was in Pacific time zone in California, and I'm here in Eastern in Ontario. And my day started a lot earlier than hers. So there was a thing where she would send me this story, and then I would have a chance to read it at night, go to bed, think about, and then the next morning sit down, reread her chapter, and then write my next chapter. Like we knew what was going to happen, but I didn't know the specifics of what had just happened because it was very sequential. Hmm. And that was so fun because every single time and julie and i uh we had to give up doing this because every time i'd send her a chapter i go oh it, no it sucks and it's horrible i'm so sorry i'll rewrite it but here here's what i got and then she would read it and love it and she'd do the same thing going oh this is a horrible chapter <laughs> and i would go julie this is amazing i love it and so uh the um what was the uh the when you believe that you're not that good at it the um imposter syndrome was mm -hmm. really really strong in both of us throughout the whole process and then we finally said enough just turn in your chapter. No need to apologize saying that it's horrible. Um, what a great experience, though. Hmm. So, and did you, Mark, sorry. Sorry, go ahead, Dave. Uh, I was just going to say, um, you mentioned that you've um, 
been involved with uh, Kobo. Mm -hmm. um, now you you work uh, closely with uh, Drafter Digital, uh, and I was just wondering, could you maybe talk about some of the pros and cons of you know going direct to companies like Kobo and Apple sure. and so on versus using you know Drafter Digital? Yeah, of course. Um, uh, I have to confess that even when I worked at Kobo. I was using draft to digital to make my EPUBs because their EPUB conversion tool, which is free and anyone can use, you can just go and make an EPUB and just take it away and do whatever you want with it. Sell it direct, load it to another platform. So I was still going to D to D to make all my EPUBs. I was publishing direct to uh, Kobo because I created the platform. I'm kind of proud of it. Uh, I was publishing direct to Kindle, Amazon, world's biggest bookstore. And then I'd just been using draft digital to get into all the other places. Um, uh, at the time, Nook didn't really have uh, allow Canadians uh, to publish direct. So, and Apple, oh God, even on a good day is not easy to use, even with a Mac. <laughs> so I'd always decided to use, um, you know, uh, get into a whole bunch of platforms with a push of a button. And I go direct where I think I can get some benefits. So. The benefit of going direct is you have direct control at the platform. You may get uh, more promotional opportunities when you're direct because Kobo, for example, very specifically, and even Nook in a lot of cases, uh, favor direct sales, uh, people who are publishing direct and, and give more promotion opportunities to those than those who come in th from a distributor. The other benefit is you make a full 70% when you're publishing direct if you go through a distributor Draft Digital doesn't charge anything up front. They make their money on the sales, and they they basically keep 10% of that margin. So you're only making 60%. So I think the thing that I don't think there's one right way to do it, um, and I do a, a combination of everything, um, but I think what happens is some people will weigh the benefit of having to create six or seven different accounts as opposed to going, oh, my God, when I do it, like Richard was talking mm -hmm. earlier about the back matter. Well, that's one of the nice things. Draft to digital will automate that for you if you use the automated back matter using universal book links. So every time you publish a new book, it'll automatically update the back matter and all your other books and send that off. So that's one of the benefits of automated back matter. Um, but then there's the there's the it's the catch twenty two. What what do you you know do you have more time? Uh, do you have to hire an assistant to do that? Um, Draft to digital does have, and so does Apple, and so does Nook. But uh, Kobo and, and um, uh, Amazon don't have this, but all those other platforms, and I, I believe Google Play has it too, where you can assign an assistant who can go in and access and update your metadata for you and make price changes, but won't have access to your banking information. So they don't, you don't have to give them your login uh, if you have a virtual assistant. Um, hmm. One of the reasons I do publish, uh, so for example, this was, I would normally go direct to Amazon and Kobo and, and et cetera. But because Julie and I were doing payment splitting, so with Draft to Digital uh, for the ebook and the print book, uh, we have a fifty or not a, a somewhat of a payment split. And so what happens is they pay her directly, they pay me directly. And for this one, I didn't go direct because I don't want to have to deal with getting my eighteen cents from Amazon Mexico and then doing the math, and then it has to translate from Canadian American to Canadian where I lose money. Uh, Bank of Canada always takes some. And then I got to translate it back to American and I lose some of the exchange to go pay. So it, it's so much easier to get the pays directly and draft to digital sends a tax form to me and one to Julie. And I don't have to go, I took in X amount of money and then I gave half of it away. You know, the, the, my tax trail is a lot cleaner when I don't have mm -hmm. to touch that money. Otherwise, I have to create an invoice and, and register all that, and she's got to claim it as income from me. And I can't. I'm not authorized to give tax forms out. I'm sorry. I'm a sole proprietorship, <laughs> <laughs> and and I, who wants to monkey with that? Anyway, so that's those are some of the pros and cons. But I don't think there's any one way of doing it. The way that's doing it, I always say, is what feels right for you and your comfort level, and the time, and what your priorities are. No, that's great. Yeah. So one thing I want to touch about on is uh, if anyone has ever met Mark outside, well, even if you met him at your house, you probably, Mark doesn't go really anywhere without uh, this friend of his that I always feel sorry for. He doesn't seem like he eats very much. Uh, Barney <laughs> B. Bones. I, I thought we'd be seeing him today. I don't actually see him in the background. You know what? My apologies. I should have. Uh, normally I would I, I'd hang is him. Is he right on the front lawn? Yeah. He is. Uh, no, he's in my car outside. 
Oh, yeah, we have a whole bunch of other skeletons on the front uh, yard, which are the old versions of Barnaby, because I've, I, they, they wear out and their spines break and stuff, and so I have to buy new. <laughs> I, I love the stories about the old Barnabys, but anyone who knows Mark knows Barnaby Jones, and Barnaby Bones, sorry, no, I have a Jones on my thing here, Barnaby Bones, and he travels with Mark when he does any of his book signing events, and uh, whenever I see, like, Mark is not a small guy, like, Mark is tall. And uh, when he has a 10 by 10 booth at these book signing events, and he's got like at least 33 books out. And he's got seven more that he's edited. Like he is behind a wall of books. When I look over at his tent, I can just see the top of Mark's head and he's kind of peeking out from around his books. <laughs> and then I can see Barnaby and uh, Barnaby's more front and center for, for people to bump into. And, and I was just thinking, and it's funny you said that is I would love to use Barnaby for to sit in my pasture seat. And then go drive down all the HOV lanes in Toronto when I go to pick my books up the next time I have an order. So if I can borrow him sometime. You, it, it's not going to work, my friend. I, I did it once where I pulled him from the back seat into the front seat, put a hoodie on him because I needed to get to work faster and I was late for a meeting. And I needed to get in the HOV lanes just to pass a bunch of slow people. <laughs> but I was so terrified of getting caught. Um, but no, I, I, would, I wouldn't dare do that. You could get in so much trouble. <laughs> I have been pulled over uh, at a ride program with Barnaby when I was heading up to Sudbury uh, to launch the book Spooky Sudbury. It was the middle of the night. It was about one in the morning, and I was going up through Point de Barrel, which is uh, you know north of Perry Sound, or Point de Barrel, if you want to. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a ride program uh, where they're checking for drunk drivers <laughs> come down the highway, and I actually had Barnaby in the passenger seat you know, with me and boxes of books in the back. And uh, he pulled me over and he says, uh, you know, where are you going? So oh, I'm heading up to Sudbury. He goes, okay, have you been drinking? I'm like, no. And then he goes, how about, uh, how about your buddy? And, and I kind of looked at him and I thought, okay, do I, do I do this joke? And I said, oh, officer, alcohol goes right through him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then he got really serious and goes, seriously, what's with the stiff? <laughs> oh, no. I'm like, well, this is my friend Barnaby Bones. You see, I'm a horror writer, and I'm going to launch my book of ghost stories about Sudbury. Officer, would you like a signed copy? And I reach into the back. <laughs> You'll have a story to tell people about this weirdo on the highway. <laughs> and so did you get a – oh, it was a ride check. It wasn't a, it wasn't a ticket that you were getting – no, no, no. It was It was just a, a see if you were drinking. Like, I was drinking coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's a great story. I love How the storytelling. Did... Sorry. How did Barnaby – Sorry, it's okay. Go ahead, Christy. It's, no, I just, I just wanted events, to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to know how Barnaby came to be in the first place. So when I put my my first book uh, came out in two thousand and four. Uh, I self published it back way before all the cool kids were doing it. Um, and I put a, a collection of short stories together that had been previously published, and I called it One Hand Screaming. And when I was doing book uh, events, I used to bring one of my skulls here, York. You know. And it would be like, oh, cool! I'll put York because uh, you know, one hand screaming had a, it was a close up of my eyeball with a with a skull in it, and so I was like, oh, I'll have a skull on the table. And I think I might have bought the, this not this version, but an earlier version at um, Winona Peach Festival. It was a craft thing. It was like a little thing you put um, um, tea lights in, and 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 the eyes would glow. And so I, I had that on my table, and that was kind of a cool thing. And then. I just started to collect things and people would buy me stuff. And then uh, I saw a skeleton and I thought, oh my God, wouldn't it be so cool to get a full, full size skeleton as I'm doing these different book events. And the reason I, I like it is um, it's, it's kind of, um, if people see me sitting there with a skeleton in front of a bookstore or whatever, they either know to avoid eye contact with the crazy tall bald guy because, oh my God, this is scary. Or they see the skeleton and they run up to me going, oh my God, this is so my cup of tea or blood or whatever it is. And and so it's kind of a, a magnet for the right readers and, and a repellent for the people who don't want to read my kind of stuff. They, can, they know what they're in for. Uh, it's a trick. Uh, I'm going to offer this trick as well. The other trick that you can use, especially if you're in a bookstore, is see with the store, instead of having your books only on your table, see if they can have your books on display a good 10, 15 feet away from you. Because people are curious, but they don't want to come up and they don't want to be sold to. They don't want to be pitched to. They want a chance to see if it's their thing. And so when I've done that, you can see them like, oh, there's a guy with a skeleton. What's this all about? But they don't want to come over and talk. They don't want to look because people don't want to be sold to. 
Mm. They go over and they see the books on a display. They pick them up and they're way out of earshot or I can't reach out to them and try to sell them. And then they can check the book out without any pressure. And then if they like it, usually what happens is they run over and go, is this, is this your book? Can you sign it? Um, and th that's a little trick that you can potentially use to, to help yeah. with um, those books. So, but anyway, that's what Barney's about. And I would often put a t-shirt on him with one of my book covers because a lot of people want to take a picture with them. And the other thing about that is it's great because social media, you got your book cover on, on that. Uh, but he's a great icebreaker because people like Richard would come up and say, hey, can I borrow him for the HOV lanes? Right. And it's like, it's a fun thing, right? It's a fun conversation. Or they go, hey, your buddy looks like he needs to eat. In which case I can joke and say, yeah, if only I could afford to feed him by selling some books. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great icebreaker. It really, really is. It. That's great. No, he's an awesome. And does he talk much? Barnaby doesn't say much. He just grins. He has his goofy grin. And we have the same hairstyle, too. So I even put a fake little beard on him one, one time. I had to put this little, just so that we kind of looked a little bit more more familiar, similar. <laughs> oh, boy. That, that's fantastic. I love it. And that's, been, that's a really, really good strategy as well that you mentioned. What a great point, you know, people not wanting to be sold to. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, no one wakes up and wants to be sold to, but someone might go, oh my God, that book Christy was talking about sounds so good. I got to go to her website and buy it so I can get the free Halloween treat, right? Yeah. They don't want right. to be sold to, but they want they want fun things. Sure. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's so true. Yeah. But they may want to buy. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> so one of the other things that you do, Mark, is uh, you do uh, consulting sessions with authors. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I believe it's even possible uh, that you uh, do, is it 20 minutes of time free? Yep. Yeah. Um, which sounds like an amazing, kind of like uh, amazingly generous thing. Uh, so could you maybe talk about a little bit about that and kind of like what sure. people should expect and so on? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I've worked in the book industry for 30 years and I have a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience and, and a lot of failures too. I've learned a lot from failures. And so um, I'm more than happy to talk to people and share ideas. One of the challenges is, is answering an email. It, it just takes so much time because people ask a question and I got to type it out and, and I, it seems selfish of me, but I don't have time to answer every single email that comes in, but it may take me less time to just give you 20 minutes of a conversation yeah. and I'll record it for you and send it to you. So you can like watch the video. So you don't have to be taking, you know, crazy notes. And, and the reason I want to do a free 20 minute is sometimes people just have some basic questions and I'm more than happy to help them. I, I can't take too much time, but I want to take some time and say, Hey, if I can spend 20 minutes and answer some basic questions to help you save time, money, anxiety, hassle, there's so many crooks and there's so many, um, people, nefarious players in the book industry. It, you know, sometimes it's like, hey, can you can can we just look at this contract together? <laughs> so someone's offered me this deal. Should I sign it? I'm like, well, if I were you, I would look at this clause and this clause. Like, I'll do whatever. Uh, and and because I think I've been really lucky to have worked with a lot of great people. I've learned from so many people. There've been so many writers out there that have been so generous with their time uh, to me if I can just do a little bit to give back. And so that's why there's that 20 minutes of free. I do charge a uh, hundred dollars us an hour. I keep getting told by a bunch of people that I know in the industry that I'm charging way too little, but again, there's two things. I, I the reason I charge money is because I can't just keep doing everything for free. I've got to, you know, make, make a, a bit of a living, but more, more than that, it's, people take it a little bit more seriously when they have to pay, but I don't want to charge too much because, I want beginning writers to feel like they're actually getting some value. So for example, if somebody's like, Oh, I'd like to hire you and, and, and pick your brain for an hour. I'm like, well, don't do the 20 minutes for free. Make sure you know what you're getting, because I'll be honest with you. You may not like my style and why waste a hundred dollars if you can get it for free. And if I can answer your questions in 20 minutes, great. We both win. You're good. You saved a hundred dollars. And, and you maybe saved money because you didn't, you know, potentially you learned from one of my mistakes that I shared with you. So, so that's, that's kind of fun. So if you go to marklesley.ca uh, slash consulting, or if you just click on, on the link there, you'll see there's a, there's a link where you can go check my calendar and you can book a time. Um, and again, I'll talk, I'll talk about anything you want. Um, I, I'm not really, really good at coaching people on the craft of writing. So if you're looking for, 
a half hour session where you hope I can critique your work or something like that, I'm probably not going to be that good. I'm not a good developmental editor person. So, <laughs> but I will talk about the business of writing and publishing until the cats come home. No, and that's awesome. You do that. something. Sorry. It's okay. I was just going to say he does that so well. Uh, we had a, a consultation with Mark uh, about a year, year and a half ago when uh, I was considering going wide and, uh, like his, you know, we came prepared with a lot of questions and we grilled him and uh, he just answered them point blank. And we left that meeting and, and and I'm not trying to set a bar here for you, Mark, but I think Mark spent a bit more than 20 minutes with us. You, know, like, <laughs> you also bought me some beers, so I owed you. That, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> that, I'm just saying, no, you're just that type of person and uh, you're, you're just so great and uh, to work with and to speak to and uh like you answered our questions and you made us feel good about what we were doing and we went ahead and did it and like we we appreciated that so if anyone's uh, seriously considering that uh, mark's a great person to talk to i just want to point out something here before we go any farther uh alexander marie says that's funny i walked by richard stand and just what you're talking about before where uh you know people are afraid to actually come up and talk to you because uh, they don't want to be preached to and yes yeah, so that's what happened <laughs> absolutely yeah 30 years of experience selling selling yeah. books, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's funny when you're doing book events because a lot of times, like, you know, I'm thinking I should engage them, I should engage them. And then when I engage them, all of a sudden they look at you like, who the heck are you talking to me? And they walk away. And I, well, I shouldn't have done that. And then other times I don't engage them. And then I'm thinking, oh, I, I might have lost a sale there because I didn't tell them. A lot of times they don't realize you're the author. They just think you're the bookseller. Yeah, and, it's hard to tell. Yeah, yeah. It's, hard. it's really hard to tell. Different people want the engagement, and other people just want to check things out without being bothered. That's right, and I'm wrong <clears> so many times when, <laughs> when it comes to that, and then I throw my hands up in the air, and I, then I don't do it, and that's the wrong attitude, too, so it's a tough thing. But that's the thing. Like, So, you know, Richard and I, you and I have been at a bunch of uh, book events together, and so somebody may come up and I go, hey, so what do you like to read? And like, oh, I love fantasy. I love epic fantasy. And I was like, you know what? I don't have anything here for you. But oh my God, you gotta go talk to my friend Richard. He's gonna he'll set you up. You'll be you'll be good for a while. Um, and and that when you're doing an event like that, if you're familiar with who else is nearby and what they sell, mm -hmm. you know, I have one romance book, but if someone's looking for romance, I'm like, oh my God, no, you gotta go see my friend over there. She's got some great books, you gotta check them out. Um, and 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 I learned that from my bookseller days. I'm, I'd rather spend time putting the right book in their hands and they'll probably have a positive memory of me. When I was a bookseller, this used to happen to me all the time. People would come to my bookstore where I worked, where I was a manager, to ask me questions that were nothing to do with the bookstore and nothing to do with books because they knew I would give them an honest answer. So get this, I got foot traffic into my bookstore because people wanted to know something about where the best plumbing store was in the mall or whatever, whatever it was they were looking for. People came into my store, walked into my bookstore, which foot traffic's important for retail mm -hmm. um, because of that. And, and so it's kind of like, um, it's, it's like selling a book today and, get, and getting one sale or, or getting a, a, the right reader for life. Uh, there's that sort of that weird balance. Yeah, you're paying a lot of money to be there. You want to make sure you make your money back, but you have to. It, it's this really. I don't know. I, I, um, I, I I'm not a. I'm actually not an extrovert. I, I'm I, I'm I'm very much an introvert. Um, I can play the role. I'm an omnivert. I can play the role, but I'm not all that good at it. Um, so I I'm not as good, for example, as I've seen you in action, Richard. You're amazing at at engaging with people, and I'm just more of a I'll just let Barnaby do the. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I'm a I'm a total introvert myself. Like I I do not. Do well you're so good at you. I don't like going to parties just because <clears throat> I'm the guy who stands in the corner. I, I I'm just not into small talk. But when it comes to my books, I know my books, so I don't mind talking about them. Well, that's true. Yeah, you're passionate about it, right? Mm -hmm. What about you guys, uh, David and Christy? Are you are you okay with that chatter in the in the selling? Mm. No. I mean, <laughs> it, it depends on my mood and the people approaching me too. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's tough at first. I remember uh, Dave inviting me up to uh, Sudbury to do the Sudbury Coffee uh, Graphicon. I guess it was the year before that we did it with you, Mark. And uh, yeah. I remember standing there and someone said, oh, that's an interesting book. They saw the cover of A Trolls and Evil Things. I said, uh, so what's it about? And I looked at him blankly like I'd never seen the book before in my life. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to say. I, I had no idea how to explain what my book was about, even though I'm the one who wrote it. So I finally picked it up, turned it around and gave him the back cover. I said, here, read this. And it, it, it's very bizarre. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> when you first do these book events, like I've done so many of them now that it's just natural. And my wife probably just hears this in her sleep all the time. I say the same thing over and over and over again. It, it just becomes second nature. But it, at first, it can be very daunting, especially if you're introverted. Like I am introverted. I, but when it comes to my books, I know my spiel now because I've done so many. It's just it's just that thing. You just got to get out there and do it again and again and again. And all right. of a sudden, it becomes second nature. And you don't think about it anymore. Are you an actor delivering lines in a role? potentially so you're just playing the role of confident author <laughs> I, I guess so because i'm certainly not a confident speaker to people i i i know my limits i know my my strengths and that's not one of them but uh, when it comes to selling books I, i've just done enough events that i'm now comfortable and i don't mind doing it anymore like before i used to stress over it just like you used yeah. to stress over doing interviews and now here we're doing podcasts so there you go <laughs> as, as an author you just you just got to get out there and you just got to do it if you want to get yourself known because Oh, no, yeah. people! If you don't, people don't know you. They're not going to come. Hey, tell me about you. <laughs> they're just not going to do that. So, you know, yeah, people buy books from those they know, like and trust. And and the fact that you guys have this show, people get to know you, mm -hmm. right? And then they go, oh, they write my kind of thing. I'm going to go check out their books. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it, and, and it, the word of mouth from other authors and doing shows like this is just a. It's another thing to get your name out there and. Okay. Yeah, people don't know who Richard A. Stevens is, but if they hear my name enough, they're gonna say, "Who the heck is this guy? Like, why do I always hear about this schmuck?" And then you know, <laughs> some of them might be tempted to actually look me up. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm very introverted, and I've got better at it, I think. But uh, I still, I'm still not very confident with the whole kind of in-person interaction. Um, people tell me that I sound very confident, um, but um i never feel confident you know and i always find kind of like live interactions quite stressful i, I actually find these still quite stressful actually um you know I've, again i've got better at it but uh it's just kind of like something i'm not naturally kind of confident in, i guess mm -hmm. but like you say, richard i mean it's like you have to do it because you you have to, how else are you going to get your name out there hmm yeah no one else is going to do it for you so yeah um, unfortunately it, you know I, I always tell people i said if you, i'll pay you five hundred thousand dollars if you make me a million i had no problem doing that we'll just split a 50 50 and you know i haven't found that person yet but uh <laughs> <laughs> but so we got a couple more comments coming in here they haven't steered me wrong yet and i, I think they're talking about uh probably you and me mark uh it's alexander marie and then she's saying that uh I have five new authors I adore on my shelf now because of this show. Yeah, that's you awesome. hosts haven't steered her wrong oh, yet. Oh, okay. All right. All right. That's <clears> awesome. Yeah. Well, that, I'm glad that uh, you're actually uh, appreciating some of the authors we have on. I guess I'll very much appreciate that. I find it I believe I can publish a book. You guys make it easy. You must be talking about draft to digital Patricia. <laughs> yes, <laughs> draft to digital .com makes it so easy to publish your book. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I'll stop. <laughs> you know, I'm saying you wouldn't know it, Dave. You do these so well. You, you certainly do. And yeah, I didn't guess you were nervous. Yeah. yeah. Well, these come in hot and heavy now. People might not relate to some genres, but I found that they always relate to people and stories. Uh, yeah, Wanda, that is so true. They relate to people. I mean, yeah. I've I've read books that I never thought I would read because the person intrigued me, and yeah. I was like, well, I don't read this genre, but I like this person. I like their style. And, and I'm going to check it out. That's why I think content marketing is a really, really good thing for authors to do. Content meaning you're putting stuff out there. You, you guys are, are content marketing with this podcast. So, you know, people are getting to know you and you get to chat and, and they get to see you as real people. Um, and then if they like what they see, they'll go check out your, your stuff. Um, and, and because they go, well, they're entertaining. I bet you their books are entertaining too or, or whatever, right? Or they're motivating or they're inspirational. Or, or whatever the case may be. No, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, our time has just flown by. It's now we're almost <laughs> at the 50 minute mark. So, and uh, we don't want to keep you too long, Mark. We, we normally on here for 45 minutes, but uh, you do a lot of uh, in person events. So, when's the next one for Mark Leslie? In person, we'll be um, going to Vegas. Um, I was just in Maryland, uh, and uh, that was a really fun, quick trip, <laughs> 10 hour drive down. One day, ten hour that, drive back. That's as a presenter, though, correct? No, that was uh, I was there on behalf of Draft Digital. I had a booth and I did a presentation, yeah. and then yeah. and then and at, at twenty books, uh, fifty k in Vegas uh, in early November. I will be there. Mm -hmm. 
I'm doing three talks. I'm doing uh, one on the main stage and a couple on the other uh, stages as well. So that's going to be that's going to be a lot of fun because um, lots of authors, lots of interaction, lots of learning. And then I uh, obviously in November we have an in-person event in uh, Saint Jacob. And I think I've got another. In oh, oh God, no! This at the end of the month. At the end of the month, I'm going to be in Frightmare in the Falls. Niagara Falls, Canada, uh, horror uh, conference, and I've got a table that you're not going to be there probably because it's uh, horror themed. No, no. Yeah, so I've got my table there. I'm still bringing the Canadian mounted because I mean, you know, <laughs> oh, for sure. No, <laughs> lots of people love awesome. John Hughes. <laughs> so. Why not? And when am I back in Sudbury, Patricia? That's such a good question. Um, uh, the the house I own up there uh, is actually has someone living in there, so I don't have an easy way to just go and stay somewhere. <laughs> I used to be able to stay with my mom there, um, but I haven't booked anything for Sudbury. But I I should look at it because honestly, oh the Sudbury bookstores and the people in Sudbury are so good to me, so so good to me. Um, I I did an event with uh, my local library when I was there in the summer and because I spent most of my summer <laughs> up north. But, uh, oh, my God, it's just, uh, there's nothing like that hometown love. There really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And before we go, what's what's the next thing on the Mark Leslie horizon? Like you did so many things. Like Is it a, another one of your Lover's Moon uh, sequel? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah, so book six in my Canadian Werewolf, The Humorous Urban Fantasy Adventures. Book six, Hex and the City. Um, Julie and I are co-authoring that. We're going to be each writing 50,000 words for it in November. We have our editor book for the middle of December for the first pass, wow. second pass in January. Goes to the um, our narrators. We have a female and male narrator. Um, Scott Overton from Sudbury is, is, is the voice of Michael Andrews. And, and that's coming up in March. So that's the next big, big project for me. And... Where can we find your books? Obviously, uh, at marklesley.ca. And I know this is a silly question because I know you very well, but people might not. Yeah. Uh, you're obviously on Amazon, but you're also published wide. So where can people yeah. find your books easily? You go to marklesley.ca. You'll find links. You can go to books2read.com slash marklesley. You'll find links to my books on all the platforms, including a carousel that's free. And I actually shared in my private chat. Uh, I've got a bit.ly link for uh, four Halloween or four, four stories. Perfect for Halloween. It's uh, bit.ly uh, slash Mark Leslie Treats, and you'll be able to download that in EPUB, Mobi, or PDF if you're interested. Um, I always put that out as a treat for people who come trick-or-treating, so the adults who like to read can, hey, just go to this URL. <laughs> and, uh, I'm probably going to do the QR code for them this year, uh, scan it, and so you can download it for free. It is it's for sale, uh, but I, you know, for your, for your uh, viewers, if they want for scary tales uh i put that together specifically this morning uh just to make sure that i had it available for you guys no that's awesome we got it in the comments now so people can actually see it yeah <clears throat> and patricia said you can stay with her so oh awesome thank you there you go yeah <laughs> be careful patricia i might be taking the skeleton well, we might all because we don't know who that's addressed to that i think all four of us are coming up to stay with patricia yeah there you go <laughs> And I love bacon and Mark loves beer. So we're bacon we're and of, beer are, are just perfect together. We're yeah. a couple of hose heads, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that's another one. You're gonna have to do something with Take off, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So anyway, thanks again, Mark, for being on us. We really enjoyed having you. We hope we can have you on here again because you got so much to talk about and uh, you're such a great guest. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. So next week on Lurking for Legends, we'll be chatting with science fiction author Aaron Frail. One of Aaron's taglines is good times and hope for a better future. Comedy is his jam. When not writing, he can be found teaching, podcasting Aaron's horror show and screaming while playing guitar for the band Spiral. Now, generally people scream when I play guitar, but they're trying to tell me to stop. Mm -hmm. So we'll see how uh, maybe we can get uh, Aaron to play us a riff or something. So until next week, for Mark, Christy, Dave, and myself, we hope you all have an amazing week. Until we meet again, take good care. Good night. <laughs>